The world of podcasts, broadcast, and streaming microphones has gotten shockingly competitive lately. It seems like every month or two, something new comes out that promises to be the new best mic. But amidst all of this, one microphone has weathered the storm and surely remained one of the most popular, reliable, and best sounding options. The Shure SM7B Shure has had a lot of competitors try and take its place, but this is the first time that I think one might have actually succeeded. So let's look at why the blue Sona blew me away. At first glance, even though their designs are different and the Sona is on a tabletop stand for the time being and the SM7B is on a boom arm, it's pretty easy to see that the Sona is directly inspired inspired by the SM7B. But who is this microphone for? For whom does the blue toll? <laughs> Feature-wise, I think that the blue Sona is a really good XLR microphone for anyone who needs an XLR mic for you know spoken word applications. But if you look at how Logitech and Blue, and I'm confused, as you might know, Logitech purchased Blue a number of years ago. So I think this is a Logitech microphone, but it's also a Blue mic. I don't know which one. I'm just going to call it the Sona because it's my microphone. I'm this Sona's Ona. But if you look at how Blue and Logitech are positioning this microphone and marketing it, it really does seem like they're targeting people who are looking to upgrade to their first real microphone, for lack of a better term. Maybe somebody who's been using like a built-in webcam microphone or a simple USB microphone. And now they wanna take the leap, invest a bit of money and get something that's on a more professional level. And this really is where I think that the SM7B's biggest weakness lies for the home or independent YouTuber, streamer, podcaster, somebody who's not in a professional studio environment. Whoop. Let's switch over to the SM7B right now. This microphone has been around for decades. It has a well-deserved reputation and it's one of my personal all-time favorite microphones and it was originally designed and intended for professional use in professional studio applications. And that's an important thing to keep in mind because professional studios have the infrastructure in place to support equipment like the SM7B. They have an entire wall of preamps and mixers and interfaces and everything you need to help any microphone sound its absolute best. But as the SM7B started to become more prevalent in home setups and like independent setups, less professional, I guess you could call it. I, I hope that doesn't sound offensive, but stuff like what I'm doing right now, as it started to become more popular in these situations, it also started to cause a lot of frustration for people. I've known so many people who were excited to get the SM7B. They saved up for it. They wanted it. They finally got their SM7B. They wanted to plug it in and sound amazing because they've heard how good this microphone can sound. And then they were just disappointed because the microphone did not sound the way they were expecting it to. And that's because they then needed to look at the interface that they were using, maybe preamps or boosters, maybe looking at sound treatment for their environment. And they realized it wasn't just about upgrading the microphone, but it kind of needed this whole other world, this whole other infrastructure in order to really work. And now we're back on the Sona and I am 100% aware that those problems I mentioned with the SM7B really aren't with the microphone and they could be addressed by just doing more research into the mic before buying it. And I myself have made the same mistake. I've been using SM7Bs since 2014 when I started putting together some podcasting and audio setups for schools and school districts. And even though I was so excited to get these microphones, I was actually pretty shocked by how bad they sounded at first. That is until I was able to get the proper equipment that it needed to sound its best and of course the sm7b sounds amazing you don't know what you don't know you don't know what questions to ask and i think for the average person who's just looking to upgrade their microphone the thing that they're looking into when they want to upgrade their microphone believe it or not is the microphone and so the natural assumption is that new mic is all you need for better sounding microphone. So going back to the SM7B now, I do think that these microphones sound incredibly similar to one another. This is the Shure and this is the Sona, which I think sounds amazing. The difference being that the Sona will perform this way with basically any XLR interface as long as it has phantom power and basically every XLR interface I'm aware of does have phantom power. It's a pretty standard basic feature. And that is actually a little bit strange because even though the Sona is a dynamic microphone, it does require phantom power because it has a built-in 25 decibel booster. So for anyone who's ever used an SM7B and then realized you needed a booster like a Fethead or a Cloudlifter or something like that, that is just built in to the Sona. So it eliminates needing to even worry about that. The only caveat being that the microphone only works with phantom power 
It will not give you any signal if you don't use phantom power. But that does really help the microphone to become plug and play with pretty much any interface. And in addition to that, they've also given it a super cardioid pickup pattern, which is going to help reject off axis sound, which does help the microphone perform just a little bit better in less than ideally sound treated environments. So that basically means it's a very directional microphone. It's an end address microphone. So you talk into the front of it, but as soon as I start turning it away, you'll hear my voice fade out. And on the side, you shouldn't really hear anything. Behind the microphone, you might hear a little bit. Over on the side, not much until we get pretty close to being right on axis again. If I move away, it disappears pretty quickly. The SM7B, on the other hand, has a cardioid pickup pattern, and so that means it's a little bit wider. I can be a little bit more off axis, even though the SM7B definitely prefers to be close to the source of the sound. So it's not gonna be like a night and day difference, but it does mean that if you're in an environment that's not super well sound treated, the Sona will perform just a little bit better than the SM7B. One of those little features that does help it to become a little more accessible to kind of the average person. And on top of all that, the Sona is priced at $50 less than the SM7B. This has an MSRP of $350 and the SM7B is $400. So at this point, you're probably thinking, wow, what an interesting commercial I'm watching for the Blue Sona. And I promise you that this video is not sponsored. I purchased this microphone myself because as soon as it was announced, I was so interested in it because it really does seem like it solves a lot of those pain points that people experience with the SM7B if they don't already have have an existing audio setup to work with. And it also comes with a separate colored windscreen, which is pretty cool because the windscreens just work with magnets. So if I take this one off, this one just clicks in with magnets and I've got this bright orange reddish color. This is a pretty interesting feature that the Sona has. I don't really know what kind of person would ever want like a custom colored windscreen for a microphone. I have no idea why they thought that would be a popular thing that people would want to do. Seems kind of crazy to me, but honestly, I think it's pretty fun and I hope to see more colors available, both because it's fun to customize your microphone and in a studio situation, it can actually be helpful if you have several of these together and they have different colors. It can help you then on your mixer to know which one is connected to which channel. Reporterstore.com windscreens that I get for the SM7B do fit on the blue Sona, but they are a different shape. It's like a square-ish body or rectangular shaped body going into a cylindrical shaped windscreen. Uh, but this blue and white combo right here is pretty cool. So it'd be really fun to have like more options than just the red orange one here. And the microphone itself does also come in a black version. I just got the white one because I thought that it looked super cool and I wanted to visually be able to differentiate it even more from the SM7B. But this is also now where you can really see some of the design similarities between the Sona and the SM7B. They both have pretty much the exact same metal windscreen underneath the foam windscreen. The Sona's capsule is closer to the top than the SM7B. This is important because the SM7B is very, very good at rejecting plosives. And part of that is because it forces you to be away from the capsule. So Peter Piper pitched a podcast. Peter Piper pitched a podcast. I'm like trying to plosive this Peter Piper. Peter Piper. The Sona's a little more susceptible, but if we put our windscreens back on, Peter Piper pitched a podcast. Peter Piper pitched a podcast. They're pretty similar. The Sona is probably a little more plosive prone, prone to plosives, but it's pretty minor overall. Speaking of separate windscreens, the SM7B does come not only with its normal black windscreen like this, but also with a very, very big puffy windscreen that will basically never let any plosives get through it. So you can be a very close talker or somebody who's not used to using microphones and still get great results with the SM7B. Should also mention just for right now, I'm running both of these into the Rodecaster Pro with no effects and no processing whatsoever. The SM7B is at 55 decibels and the Sona is at 25 decibels because it has that built-in booster. But beyond the visual things like the color and the windscreen, <laughs> the build quality of the Blue Sona is really, really great. It is an all metal body. It has this one single-sided yoke. The SM7B has a yoke that goes on both sides of the microphone, and it has just one big knob that makes it very easy to adjust and tighten. So it's a really easy microphone to use. It's very, very clean and streamlined. There's a couple things that I really love about this design. First, it has the same thing that the SM7B has where you can just twist the mount here to attach the microphone. You don't have to like spin the microphone on your boom arm or your mic stand. I love that. Every microphone should have that. So I'm glad that they borrowed that from the SM7B. They also moved the XLR port from the SM7B. So the SM7B, it's on like the stem right here. You have the XLR port. 
And this kind of seems like it's either positioned perfectly in a situation like this on this boom arm, it works great, or it's positioned absolutely terribly. If you're on like a shorter stand, it can sometimes be hard to plug things in or add a booster and plug it in. This is sort of a more convenient location to have the connector. It also means because the XLR connector is directly attached to the microphone, you don't need this little cable that the SM7B has because this connects the microphone to the XLR connector. Now I can say that having used many SM7Bs over many years, I've never had one of these cables fail. But I am always a little concerned that it's going to end up getting caught in something or pinched or bent or pulled and then the microphone would be damaged. That's not an issue at all with the Blue Sona, so it also gives it a more practical and kind of minimalistic sleek design. I really like that. The SM7B does have a few equalizer controls on the back of the microphone. So does the Sona. So you just sort of push this in and then this little plate pops off and now you have access to a bass cut and a presence boost. I'm really attracted to the implementation of magnets all over this microphone. This is with nothing turned on and then I will turn on the bass cut. So this is just the default microphone sound. And now this is with the bass cut. So you should notice some of those low end frequencies taken off. If you have a very deep rumbly voice this might be something to use or if you're in an environment where there's wind or low rumbling like an air conditioner some kind of low frequencies you might want to use this to sort of cut those out so this is with the bass cut and this is without the bass cut and the other one is a presence boost which is going to pretty much just boost sort of like some of the mids and the highs and this is without that and now this is with the presence boost this kind of gives you that more compressed sound i think this almost sounds more like a pod mic it's like the pod mic always has presence boost turned on if you add in the bass cut and the presence boost you're going to get a very kind of compressed tinny sound not a huge fan of this but it depends on your voice your situation your environment if i turn the bass cut back off now we just have the presence boost my voice is really jumping out in this situation and if i turn that off somehow now we just have the default sound of the microphone which is my personal favorite sound of the mic and i can just magnet clip that right back on normally i'm not a fan of copycat designs i always kind of figure like go with the people who did it originally the sm7b sure made this microphone many 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 years ago they did an amazing job that's why it's a standard just get this instead of something else however this is kind of my exception. It's really cool to see a version of the SM7B that's more modernized and intended to be used by people who don't have entire professional studio setups. And speaking from experience as somebody who's helped many, many people set up SM7Bs over the years, the reason I'm excited about the Blue Sona is because it really does alleviate so many of those pain points. The only bit of instruction is make sure you have phantom power turned on. And that's kind of it. So you've been listening to the Sona a lot throughout this review already, but now let's talk specifically about sound quality. We did the directional polar pattern test. We talked about the bass cut and the presence boost. We've talked about plosives, but I also want to talk about handling noise because that is one of the SM7B's secret weapons is that you can just sort of grab this microphone and move it around. And the shock mount that's built into the SM7B is just it's magical. It really doesn't pick up very much. I can tap on the microphone. You're definitely going to hear that, but I'm hitting this pretty hard. But if I just grab it and move it or I reposition the arm when the microphone's here, there's a lot of microphones that would totally be just losing their minds right now. And if I reach over here and tap on the table where the SM7B is, you can kind of hear how it is picking up or I guess more accurately rejecting those sounds. So now I've got the Sona on a boom arm. If I tap the table, feels like it's doing a pretty good job of rejecting that. If I move the boom arm, it's not picking up. If I grab the microphone, I can move the microphone without too much happening. And if I tap on the microphone, I think it's picking up a little bit more. This is the SM7B. It's really, really muffling those taps. And then this is the Sona. I think that's a little little bit more handling noise on the Sona. Let's put them both on tabletop stands and see how that works. See if it's outstanding. It's like the scarecrow that won an award for doing such a great job because he was outstanding in his field. Let's see how they reject noise. I do know just in my test before working on this, when it's on the tabletop stand, it seems like it's a bit more prone to stuff. If I start, I'm going to turn this keyboard off, but if I start typing on the keyboard furiously, writing comments about how great this video is on the SM7B, this is sort of how it rejects tabletop tapping and furious, happy comment writing, only positive comments being written. It seems actually, honestly, pretty similar. I think the only real difference 
is if I like smack the SM7B and then smack the Sona. Yeah, they're really, really similar. But I also think it's important not to let our eyes affect that judgment. And so basically what I'm gonna do is in this very high-tech chamber, also known as a cardboard box, I'm gonna put one of these microphones, I'm gonna run through some dialogue in the microphone, and then I'll switch the other one, and you can decide which one you like best, and then we'll just see, or if you can even tell them apart at all. I think I have the microphone now concealed from both angles, right? Yes, and now I am talking into microphone number one, and I will read a classic piece of literature for this test because most of us know all about the original photo encabulator, but for many years, engineers have been working to bring perfection to the crudely conceived idea of a device that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing not just cardinal gram meters, but also, also cardinal gram meters. You know, your Grammys and your Grampies. And now we are on mystery microphone number two because now we've upgraded to the deluxe photo encabulator. Basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of AV imagery being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it's produced by the modial interaction of needle magneto reluctance and capacitive directance. Sounds simple, right? So just for one more bit of reference, this is mystery microphone number one. This is microphone number one. Does it sound fun? Is it the one for you? And this is mystery microphone number two. Is microphone number two for you? Can my camera pick up my eye autofocus behind this fancy test chamber? So before we go any further, let's reveal the microphones. Microphone number two, because I'm too lazy to switch them out again, is the Sona. And so microphone number one was the SM7B. I'm really actually super curious to know what you thought about that blind test and if you preferred one, if you liked one over the other, or if you couldn't tell a difference between them. Personally, in my own tests, not just while recording this video, but also using this microphone and testing it out and comparing them prior to making this video, I'm really shocked at how similar these microphones sound. The SM7B has that sound that so many microphones are after. I'm sure that there's a difference. I'm not saying that they are identical, but they are really, really, really close. I think that the Sona is going to do a very good job at giving people a microphone that gives them the sound they're looking for if the SM7B is the microphone that's been on their radar in the first place. So up until now, you've been hearing both of these microphones run through the Rodecaster Pro 2 on just the generic dynamic mic settings. The only difference being their gain levels where the SM7B has a higher gain level and the Sona has phantom power enabled because of the booster and it has a lower gain level. But there's been no processing and no effects or anything. However, if I just turn on some of the Rodecaster Pro 2's basic processing, this is what that sounds like with the Sona. So this includes a little bit of depth, sparkle, and punch, and I think a little bit of a noise gate as well. So this is with that basic processing turned on, and this is with that basic processing turned off. Same thing with the SM7B. This is with no processing. This is just the dry signal, and this is with the basic processing turned on. You can kind of hear the same thing, noise gates. It's the exact same thing, basic processing turned on, and basic processing turned off and you hear a little bit, maybe a little bit more noise on the microphone. And one thing I really love with the Rodecaster Pro 2 is the SM7B setting. It comes with a preset already for the SM7B, and that's what I've been using for most of the time that I've had it. And this is the Sona with the SM7B preset on the Rodecaster Pro 2. I think this actually works really well because the microphones do have such a similar sound. When I'm using this microphone with the Rodecaster Pro 2, I will be using it with the SM7B preset because I do like just the added little like polish sparkle, whatever you want to call it, call it, that it gives this microphone. And here's the SM7B with that exact same SM7B preset in the Rodecaster Pro 2. Now, one thing about the Rodecaster Pro 2, as you might know, is Rode's claim is that the preamps are so good, you cannot or should not use a booster with any microphones with it. I made a whole video about this where I tested it out specifically with the SM7B and found it to be true. If you add a signal booster like a Fethead or a Cloudlifter to your signal chain with the Rodecaster Pro 2, it will actually reduce the quality of your audio, which is a great thing because it means you have a simpler setup if you're using the Rodecaster, it can just handle any microphone that you throw at it. But what does that mean for something like the Sona where it has a booster built in that you can't turn off? I really don't have an answer to that because there's no way to test this microphone without the booster turned on. So all I can do is let you listen. This is with that SM7B preset. Let's go back to just the dynamic. This is now the Sona again with no processing, no effects at all. There's no way to really know the effect that the booster is having. So all that you can do, I guess, is use your ears to hear what it sounds like. 
honestly, I think that it sounds fine, but I do think it is time to switch things up just a little bit because the Rodecaster Pro 2 is a $700 interface. I think it's worth absolutely every penny of that. But if the Sona microphone is something that is designed to help introduce people to the world of higher end microphones, adding in a $700 mixer or an interface might not be super practical or reasonable. So I have now switched over to the Focusrite Vocaster 2. I did an entire review on this thing. It's awesome. It's a really perfect like Goldilocks device in between the Rodecaster and a more simple interface. It retails for $300. It has two XLR inputs. It provides phantom power. And this is the blue Sona running through that. And I am just recording directly into Adobe Audition with no effects and no processing. I do have phantom power turned on since the Sona requires it. And I have my gain level set right at about 11, 1130 on the little gain dial here on the Vocaster 2. Now let's switch over to the SM7B going through this same interface. Now this is quite a different situation because here I have the gain almost entirely maxed out on the SM7B. I am, this is max gain and I'm clipping a little bit. So if I back that off a little bit, I am at about four o'clock on the gain dial, which is really like 90 or 95%. This really can't go much further. So the Rodecaster Pro 2 is an interface that is literally designed to drive a microphone like the SM7B. And I'm not saying the Vocaster 2 isn't, it does have 75 decibels of built-in gain, but when we're cranking all that built-in gain to this point right here, you can hear quite a bit of noise and I don't really have anywhere else to go. If I wanna get a little bit louder, I, I kind of can't. But if I'm using the Sona, which has its built-in booster, then I can get, I have all the gain in the world. I can go much, much further if I need to, or if I want to. So I think this starts to show how the Blue Sona is a little more compatible with a wider range of interfaces without needing an external booster. Let's take this even a little bit further. So now this is the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, one of the most popular XLR interfaces that there is. It's a two channel interface. There's a Scarlett Solo, which is gonna give you the same audio quality, but it only has one interface. That retails for about $120. This one right here, the 2i2 has an MSRP of about $180. So it's almost half the price of the Vocaster 2 that I was using just a moment ago. And this is the Sona running into the 2i2. I do have phantom power turned on and I have the gain dial set to right about one o'clock to the SM7B, which now I have my gain set pretty much max. I can go a little, no, it is maxed out actually. This is as loud as the SM7B can get through the 2i2. It does not have that 76 decibels of gain that the Vocaster 2 has. So this is as much as I'm gonna be getting out of the SM7B without either going into my software and boosting the level or adding in a mic booster. I'm really not like criticizing the SM7B as much as it might seem like I am going back over here to the Sona, what I'm really trying to do is just emphasize that the Sona is designed for, I don't know, normal people in non-professional studio environments. And pretty much any piece of audio interface gear that you connect this to, it's going to be able to give you good results without needing anything else. This right here looks like a scary mixer that has all kinds of professional stuff, and it's great. This is the Yamaha MG10XU. I've had this thing for about 10 years at this point. This is really more designed for like music production, but as you can see, it has a lot more manual control. We have four XLR inputs, a whole bunch of other inputs here, but this really doesn't work well with spoken word. This is the kind of thing I was originally connecting SM7Bs to back in the day when I started out. It's really designed more for, you know, miking up guitars or drums or some kind of instrument where you're just working with entirely different levels. But I think this is an important thing to test out because there are a lot of people who have something like this. For one reason or another, over the years, a mixer like this has found its way into a closet or a shelf or, you know, at, at work in an office somewhere. There's something like this sitting around to run presentations or who knows what. And it only makes sense that it's the thing you feel like. I could get a microphone, plug that into and start my podcast or start streaming or whatever. So let's see how this works with really what is not intended to be a spoken word mixer at all. This took a lot longer to set up than I expected, but I'm honestly really impressed with it. So let's talk a little bit now about the Yamaha mixer. This has a retail price, I believe of $230. And it's also just running into Adobe Audition. 
and it's definitely outputting lower levels than any of the other interfaces did, but it is working. As you can hear, this is the Sona going in to channel one. I do have a lot of like EQ options, like I can just boost the bass if I want to. That's what's really fun about these mixers is it makes it really easy to just start EQing stuff at the touch of a physical button, not having to do digital dials. I can even do stuff like this. Wow! wow. It's pretty fun. Let's talk about the settings that I'm using right now. So I do have phantom power turned on. That's how the Sona is working. I have my gain set to actually like the default setting. And that is at about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock on the gain dial. I have nothing else affected, not even any, any of the, of effects, the effects or anything or like that. that. I know the Rodecaster can like do all of this stuff now, but, but this, this has been, been able to do it for years. And it's, it's, it's really, really, really fun to just do, to just do this, this you know, turn, turn all these dials, dials you feel like a scientist. scientist. Wow! wow. <laughs> but anyway, this is what that sounds like. And my actual volume level here is set to the Unity Mark, which is the three o'clock position on this mixer. And my stereo output is also set to the three o'clock position. It's just like the default level that you should be outputting stuff at. And this is what that sounds like with the Blue Sona. Actually significantly better than I expected. However, what's working exactly as expected, let's switch over to the Blue, the Blue. <laughs> the blue SM7B because it has a blue windscreen on it. So this, actually you probably can't hear me at all right now. So now, here we go, this is the SM7B with no booster or anything. I have the same settings that I had with the Sona except that the gain is maxed out at 100%. This is as loud as the SM7B can get through this interface. That's it. This is now the SM7B running into the Yamaha mixer with the Clark Technic CT1. The reason I'm using this booster is because it's the least expensive one that I know of. It usually retails for about $35 to $40, and it works great, and it's obviously giving the microphone plenty of gain. Right now, I have the gain, instead of being at 100%, it's right at about the 1230 mark on the gain dial. At least in my headphones, I am hearing a lot of noise. Whereas if I go back to the blue Sona, even though it does have a booster, I only need to keep the gain at about 11 o'clock, so a little bit less, and then this is what that sounds like. So because I don't need to raise the gain as much, I'm not getting as much hiss and noise with the Sona. So now we've come full circle and I'm back with the Sona on the Rodecaster Pro 2 running through the generic dynamic mic setting with no effects and no processing and the gain is set to 25. So ultimately the point of this long journey is to really emphasize that while there are a lot of microphones that have come out recently and have been labeled the SM7B killer because people want to dethrone this microphone, there are a lot of reasons why I think that the Blue Sona or the Logitech Sona, whoever makes this microphone, the Sona, actually does succeed in a lot of ways. It's not that it's better than the SM7B, but it's better at taking everything that's great about the SM7B and making it more accessible to more people. And of course, that's not to say that you have to be a newcomer to use the Sona. It's also a very capable microphone for anyone who's just looking for a good XLR dynamic microphone. But I do think that it's uniquely equipped to be welcoming to newcomers, especially. So I'm a big believer in the idea that anything that encourages somebody to create more stuff and to help them sound better and to encourage them to keep going is really fantastic. So that's really why I'm so excited about the Sona, I guess, is because it's so welcoming to newcomers to the world of audio production and it's so good that it will encourage them to keep going. And then this thing that I love and that maybe you love and that people are interested in, it will keep going because more and more people are joining it and being a part of it and they're not being excluded or intimidated or anything you know, anything negative like that. And speaking of things that encourage you to keep going, thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. And I know that the world of microphones and interfaces can definitely be a bit confusing, so I've put together a playlist of videos to help you navigate that world right here.